Good afternoon and welcome to the third in this three part webinar series on how to read a cancer genome from genomics education delivered by Professor Nick Zenal. This is a Teams live event and is being recorded. You should have come in with your mics muted and your cameras off, but if that's not the case, could you turn those to off and mute now? Uh, there will be a Q&A box for you to pose questions. Please ensure those go into the Q&A and not into the chat box and Professor Nick Zenel will answer those at the end. Just to introduce her, if you've been unable to join the two webinars so far, Professor Nick Zainal is an NIHR professor at the University of Cambridge and a consultant clinical geneticist at the East of England GMSA. She's an expert in the somatic, somatic cancer genome and today is going to take us through some examples of how to interpret that. Over to you. Thanks so much, Alison. Um, I've had the thumbs up that I can share my screen. And I hope you can see that. Um, OK, so all good. Uh, so thanks so much for um, coming to the third session of um, this uh, series. Um, I'll sort of reinforce that um, my brief was to target these talks to um, SPR, Special Registrar's Training in Clinical Genetics. Um, and I sort of am basing that on my own experience and knowledge at that time as a registrar. So, um, you know, if, you're, if you've got a PhD in cancer genomics, this probably isn't for you. <laughs> uh, but, um, and I, I hope you um, will have uh, taken some of the information from my first two webinars um, and bring that to this webinar because we will be using some of it. So just to, to reinforce some of those points, what we covered in webinars one and two in webinar one, we covered some basic principles about cancer genomics, that cancer is a clonal outgrowth and next generation sequencing permits us to see all the mutations that are present. We went through primary and secondary analysis, which is how we align all the um, reference or all these uh, short resequences back to the reference genome and then how we call mutations in them. And we also touched on tertiary analytics, which was to look at driver mutations, what they are, how to think about them, how to do a little bit of curation and to always think like a medic, which is, does the picture fit? And that will be something that we come back to recurrently. Now, one thing I didn't manage to cover was the cancer evolution perspective, which would have been interesting, but not absolutely necessary. And perhaps at a future date, we can cover that if I don't get to do it today. In my second webinar, we covered mutational signatures, which was the theory of mutational signatures, and then several of the practical aspects. I focused on two, two areas. One was called signature extraction and the other one was called assignment. And assignment is the bit that I think is the most relevant to clinical genomic interpretation. And so we're going to utilize many of these principles today when we're going through these whole genome um, cancer data sets. So the first thing I want to cover is um, some basic QC when you get a whole genome, some basic things that you just want to think through right at the start before you're going to say, yes, I can interpret this cancer genome or not. So just a couple of examples. I touched on this in the first webinar. I'm just going to give you some really practical examples now. Um, so here is an example of um, some good results um, and some of the basic numbers that you're going to get when you get your report are things like tumor and normal coverage. So this is kind of about what we'd like to see over 40x for the tumor, over 30x for the normal. Um, uh, so that's all very well and good. When in my first webinar, I covered some of the other aspects of um, sequencing, of QCing sequence data, which hopefully other people will have covered for you by the time you get to this. But it was uh, just to give you a bit of background there. But basically, when you get your report, you're going to get some basic information. You're going to also get some basic information about the total numbers of mutations. And it is helpful to just do a sanity check that these numbers sort of fall in the range that you would expect for your tumor type because all the tumor types differ slightly. And there are reference ranges. So here's an example of one. This one isn't published yet, but hopefully it's coming soon. This is the gel data in purple, the ICGC, that's one of the biggest primary cancer cohorts in blue, and then the heart rate, which is the metastatic cancer cohort uh, that's very well known. That's the one in green. But here are all the different tumor types, and this gives you sort of the reference ranges of mutations for all the different tumor types that have been reported. Um, and, and this is sort of general information and when in, in any sort of decision support tool or report, it's usually helpful to have those ranges so that you know that you're roughly in the right zone. 
And the other piece of information that I, I said during my first webinar was you'll get information from copy number, which is the ploidy, the overall um, uh, ploidy for the genome, um, as well as the aberrant cell fraction, which has been estimated on the copy number data. Now, in my team, we like to look at some of these plots. They're not always available to you in many cancer genome reports, but that can actually be, um, they, they can be generated. Um, and I mentioned in the first webinar that there are some basic principles, which is that you're looking at these plots. Sometimes they're called sunrise plots because they look like a morning sunrise, um, that you have a plot of aberrant cell fraction and ploidy, and you're trying to look for the, for the lowest points in the plot. So here, this point here, um, uh, fits with a ploidy of 1.88 and an aberrant cell fraction of 65%. You don't have to see these plots, but I like to because it gives me it's a sanity check for me that the numbers I'm looking at are correct. And it also allows me to look at the copy number plot to eyeball it to ensure that this looks about right. So purple, as I mentioned before, is total copy number and blue is minor. Other people may have it in different colors, but basically you want to be able to see that your genome is roughly <laughs> deployed, not all the time, that there's some strong gains and some strong losses in the genome. So this is a really nice example of a nice clean um, cancer genome. So at this stage, we're not looking at anything else yet. We're just QCing the first bit and we're saying there's adequate tumor cellularity. There's a correct copy number result. This looks right and an adequate mutation data to proceed with an interpretation of this cancer genome. In my team, we color the box green so that we know that there's a traffic light system and we know this is good. We think the rest of this genome can be interpreted. You can read the drivers and the signatures with confidence. So here's another example, a bit more of a complicated genome, but still your tumor and normal coverage looks right. Your total subs, indels and rearrangements also fall within normal range. The ploidy and aberrant cell fraction, that ploidy is a bit higher, but aberrant cell fraction is 51%. But this looks like a correct result and this looks like a reasonable copy number plot some nice clean lines and um you know there, there's there's clear aberrations in this tumor this is perfectly reasonable for a cancer to have a high ploidy whole genome duplication is not unusual in cancers so again adequate tumor cellularity correct copy number result adequate mutation data to proceed with an interpretation of this cancer genome here's another one tumor and normal coverage just about right Subs, indels, and rearrangements also reasonable. Ploidy high, aberrant cell fraction a little bit lower. But again, nice clear plot. This looks great. Adequate tumor cellularity, correct copy number, adequate mutation data to proceed with an interpretation. Okay, sometimes you get this sort of a result. Tumor and normal looks okay. Total numbers of mutations all within fall, fall, falling within the normal sort of ranges. Ploidy is 1.96, aberrant cell fraction 56%. But when you look at this plot, you do see an alternative option here, which looks like a lower, potentially a better result. Now, um, in, in my team anyway, we give people the option of trying to reseed, trying to redefine the copy number result so you can rerun the algorithm by forcing it into to making this um, result the, the correct result. Um, and so um, and then this plot, as you can see here, there are some lines, but the lines are not really like fully up or fully down. If you force that result, you might find a slightly better result, not massively better, but it is better. <laughs> um, and actually, the problem here is that the tumor cellularity is very low. It's only 25 percent. That's that's the real problem here. So there is low tumor cellularity, a copy number result, not a great one and adequate mutation data because there's 24,000 mutations. 113 in indels and 21 rearrangements. This is quite a lot of data. So even though your copy number result is not perfect, that does not mean the whole genome needs to go in the bin. You can still salvage this information and get good data from it. So I think the bottom line here is even if this doesn't look perfect, look at the rest of it. If actually you can get, this is high numbers of mutations, you can probably make some kind of sense out of this. Okay, so this is still green. Let's look at this one. So, you know, the coverage is OK. The numbers of mutations are a little bit on the low side and aberrant cell fractions 100 percent. Now, that's very rare in the cancer. If you do see that, you, you've potentially got a wrong result. And as you look at this plot here, it just hasn't been able to get a half reasonable solution. And this copy number plot, you've hardly got any changes. You've got something happening here, which is an amplification of some sort, but this doesn't look right. And so you can try to reseed, which we did. Um, and you could get a slightly better result. It's not brilliant, 
Um, so, you know, in this sort of situation, we would go, OK, there's low tumor cellularity. This is probably what's going on. The aberrant cell fraction is only 20 percent. Sorry, this should be changed to 20 percent. Um, and there's a poor copper number result and low mutation burden indicative of inadequate tumor representation within the sample. So this low numbers is starting to suggest that you don't have enough mutations in your sample. And so consider the rest of this report with caution. The sensitivity for detection of variants may be significantly reduced. It's just something you need to bear in mind as you're going through the report. Now, I will come to some um, caveats. Oh, so pediatric tumors are the are caveat there. Um, now, you might find, for example, in a pediatric tumor that the numbers are low, but the copy number result is very clear and very clean. You get a nice copy number result and clear copy number changes, and you know that that probably is fine. It's just that it's a pediatric tumor. The range of mutations will be much lower anyway, and so this is just within normal limits for a pediatric tumor. But this is an adult tumor, and this doesn't quite look right. You could have this sort of situation. I've covered this up because the patient's ID was there. Um, coverage is OK. Total numbers of mutations is really on the very low side. Um, and, you know, these when you get these sort of tram lines, it's basically it's just not enough tumor material in there at all. So no matter what kind of seeding you do, it will just, you know, you'll just get like flat profiles. So it's almost like a germline genome because it probably is mainly germline genome. There's very little in the way of copy number changes here. So there's very low tumor cellularity here and incorrect copy number estimate and very low mutation burden and inadequate of inadequate tumor representation within the sample. I think it's a very important thing to start here because if you don't think about it like that, sometimes you're going through the rest of the genome and you don't have any data, it's really impossible to make an interpretation. So I think it's a useful step to do these. Um, but as I said, even if things look a little bit on the low side, you can still look at the rest of the genome to, to try to, to make some kind of educated guess. Chances are, though, if, you, if you're giving something a red like this, it's, it's usually not really salvageable. So those are just a couple of examples of sort of starting QC points before we actually get to the meat of the data. So that's just step one for the QC. Now we're going to look at the whole genome data together. Um, and I'm going to orientate you. You have to pay attention here because if you miss this bit, you're going to lose yourself for the rest of the presentation. So this is all the whole genome data. Um, and um, what you've got here is you'll be given information like this is an ER positive breast cancer. And out here you've got the chromosomal ideogram, chromosomes one, two, three, four, five, all the way around to X and Y. The dots are single base changes or substitutions. And they are, um, there's a distance that's calculated called the intermutation distance, which is the distance from one mutation to the one immediately preceding it in the reference genome. And if your genome is 3000 million bases and um, your mutation rate, you have about 3000 mutations in your genome, then you roughly have a mutation every million bases. So the intermutation distance is, is 1 million roughly with a bit of variation. So if you plot each mutation in terms of its intermutation distance on a log scale on this sort of radial axis, so log zero or one will be down here, then log one, log two, log three, log four, log five, all the way to six and seven, you'll find that most of the mutations are out there at log six um, or, or seven because the, the mutations are a bit sparse or muta you know, mutations are only one every million bases, and that mutations are very close to together will be further down here. OK, so this is plotted as a log of the intermutation distance on the radial axis. And the colors are according to the six mutation types. This image you have seen in the past, this is your substitutions presented as your 96 channel pattern. It's exactly the same information. There's no signature extraction. All we're doing is adding the mutations together and putting it in a histogram. And actually, you're going to be using your organic interface rather a lot. Um, uh, to just eyeball the mutation profile to check that it's it looks reasonable and I'll give you some examples as we go through. OK, then we're going to move inwards. The green lines are insertions and the red lines are small deletions. So small insertions and small deletions usually under 100 base pairs. The simple reason for that is because most mutational algorithms struggle after beyond 100 base pairs and it's impossible to validate them. Um, so these are small insertions and deletions and this is just a bar chart presenting the information in a slightly different way. So this information here is also presented here the way this information out here is also presented there. OK, then we have copy number shown in two rings. Green means gain and pink means losses. So here this is chromosome one. One Q is gained. Um, there's various bits of chromosome 
six that are lost here. So chromosome seven is gained and chromosome 16. P is gained, 16 Q is lost. Um, so, so that's all it means. It's basically your copy number information, but just plot it out um, in a circle. Um, and then you have your rearrangements or your structural variations. So here they are color coded according to this um, image down here on the right hand side. Um, and there's very few rearrangements here. So immediately you have a sense of the density of mutations. You have a summary of the, the, the substitutions, indels and rearrangements of each tumor. Um, and so you get this sort of holistic cancer genome profile per patient. And so even though your patients may not have a single mutation in common between them, everyone's genomes are so different. When you take this holistic genome approach, you can interpret these genomes to some extent. OK, let's layer on some of the tertiary analytics that I discussed in the first lecture, things like driver events. So in this case, case she's got a PIK3CA and a GATA3 mutation. Remember, I used to to press on trying to understand whether there's a copy number change that is associated with that mutation. And here for that particular mutation, we know that the total allele is two and the minor is one. So this is diploid heterozygous. Um, so this is normal heterozygous state. And does that fit with PIK3CA and GATA3? And the answer is yes, it does, because these are sort of oncogenic mutations. And so this sort of makes sense. But if you were inclined to curate, you would do what I showed you in webinar one, which is to look at these in IGV. You have the tumor reads at the top, you have the match normal reads at the bottom, and here you've got a lovely little PIK3CA uh, mutation um, um, in this particular patient present in the tumor, not present in the normal variant allele fractions of 0.43 because it's heterozygous in a copy number 21 state. So that all fits. Um, I think in general, people probably don't do curation of all the drivers, especially the really common ones and a good decision support tool will just feed back to you and say this is very likely going to be a driver because it's been thousands of times before in your breast cancer or whatever. But this is just to sort of say to you, these are the steps we kind of go through in my team to try to interpret a whole cancer genome. OK, so then we have the signatures, which was what we did in webinar two. And remember, I said the most important thing is the assignment. So here's an ER positive breast cancer. And I said that there were a few things that you want to check. The first thing was, have you fitted the right signatures? So this is a ER positive breast cancer. Have we fitted breast cancer signatures? And the answer is yes, we have. So this is just stupid names. Gel, because they've been derived from the gel cohort. Breast, because it's breast cancer. Common, because these are the common signatures. So these are the common breast cancer signatures. So we have fitted the right signatures. Great. And here we can see that the so above the threshold, the threshold is a green line. Above the threshold, we have basically signatures five, a big amount of signature eight, signature one, and a bit of signature uh, five, eight, 18, and one. OK, so remember I mentioned your organic interface. <laughs> so this is signature one, signature five, signature eight, and signature 18. That is your patient. And actually, if you just eyeballed your mutation profile and you looked at the signatures, you can see why the extraction has pulled these signatures out in your sample. So I think when I say, does it fit? I think if, 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 you, if this is your profile and the signatures don't look like you know, what you expect them to, then, then, then something's gone wrong. Um, and and so, so this is, you know, some of you will be sitting there going, well, I'm not gonna know what on earth the signatures look like. After you've done this about 10 times, you will know what the signatures look like because you will have seen it so many times. So um, yeah, so I think you know, just a, sometimes a sanity check is is kind of helpful. OK, so this looks like a reasonable sort of result. And then the qu last question I had when I was teaching you the assignment stuff was, is there anything clinically actionable from all of this? So is there anything clinically actionable from all of this? Probably not, actually. Um, so, but it, uh, it was just to kind of give you a sense of a whole genome from a box edit ER positive breast cancer. OK, here's another one. This patient does not have a single mutation in common with the previous lady, but they're both ER positive tumors. And I think you'll agree that they do look very similar. Um, so I'm flicking backwards and forwards between them just so that you get the sense. So this is the previous patient. This is a new patient. Um, and about 2000 substitutions. They've got nearly the same profile, right? Just look at the profile right hand corner. Don't they look very similar? The indels and the rearrangements also very sparse, not very many mutations. 1Q gain, 16Q loss, pick 3 ca mutation, copy number 21, and nearly the same signatures, signatures 5, 8, 
18, one a little bit of signatures three and one twenty seven. So, so signature. So the next question then, and th this looks more or less right compared to the previous patient, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. So here the next question becomes: Is there anything clinically actionable? And signature three shows up a little bit here. So you might be sitting there going, "Hmm, it is a HR deficient tumor." And you look for some of the other patterns and you don't see them. You don't see microhomology mediated deletion. You don't see tan implications or deletions. You don't see a huge number of copy number losses. So some of those other um, genomic features that are usually associated with HR deficiency are not there. And what's the other thing you could do? You could do a HR detect score and the HR detect score is very, very low. So there's nothing to see here. Basically, it's a nice quiet genome with not a lot going on. OK, so far so good. You've seen two. Let's go to the next one. I hope this looks different to you. <laughs> um, and um, so this is a triple negative breast cancer. Uh, OK, let's do some start from the subs. We've got four and a half thousand substitutions. You can see there's a bit more black here from the blackness there. Um, there's 157 insertions and deletions. Bigger bar here. This is deletions with microhomology. And there's 300 rearrangements. There's tandem duplications. They are distributed throughout the genome beautifully. And look at the pink stuff around here. That's copy number losses. That's LOH going throughout the genome. So I mentioned this to you in the last webinar. Um, I hope you can have figured out what it is, given that it's a triple negative breast cancer. Um, so drivers, uh, MIC amplification, that's pretty straightforward, 15-1. That's huge. Uh, p tan transection by a rearrangement. Mm, that might be one to look at. P53 missense, you know, your decision support folks would say this is a common one. This is probably a driver. And then there's a BRCA1 germline mutation. And so if you were inclined to curate, you might look at that BRCA1 germline mutation. Here are the match normal reads. Here's the tumor reads. It's um, heterozygous in the normal, uh, whereas it is basically homozygous in the tumor because you've lost the other allele, right? So um, this is a germline BRCA1 mutation with LOH in the tumor and copy number one zero. So this fits and it fits with the picture that you're seeing. So that P10 transaction, that's a copy number or a rearrangement, big deletion. Um, and you can see here uh, actually the copy number drop um, with the multi exon deletion in P10. So that's a nice one. Sometimes some people are not very confident with re rearrangement drivers and they kind of want to eyeball these. So that's a, that's a really nice one. So that's our patient there. Um, and the signatures are in keeping with a HR deficient tumor, signatures three, signatures eight, a little bit of signatures 13, which is Apobec. Let's look at the signatures. So signatures three and eight, that's a HR deficiency signatures, and you can see the Apobec signature there. So even if you put your hand across the three signatures below, you could actually see that this HR deficient tumor has got Apobec in it, can't you? From the end of the room, it's actually pretty obvious, an organic interface. Right, OK, so you could do a HR detect score, couldn't you? And that comes up with a score of one. So this is just me trying to communicate that actually, you know, these are you you do this in, in, in medicine all the time. You put things together, you pattern recognize, and that's basically what you're going to be doing for the next 40 minutes. OK, so so that was a nice, easy one. Um, so here is sorry, this is another case. Just to drive home um, uh, the message here that um, this is patient with six and a half thousand um, mutations. It's got it's got the deletions of the microhomology. It's got the tannin duplications. It's got the loss of heterozygosity throughout. You can see the Apobec signatures there too, can't you? So signatures wise, we've got signatures three and eight and Apobec signature 13, signature five is a bit boring, signature one. Here are the drivers, MIC, AMP, AKT3, AMP, TP53 makes sense, BRCA1, not germline, it's BRCA1 somatic. So this is an acquired BRCA1 mutation with copy number one zero, which is in keeping with this whole picture and a HR detect score that is high. Easy, right? Fantastic. OK, so for the next few, please feel free to yell at your screen. If this was interactive, I'd be asking you guys questions, but it's not interactive, I'm afraid. So I'm going to have to imagine that you're interacting with me and you're going to sort of humor me and yell at your screen screens, the answers that you think they may be as we go along. Right. OK, so um, this is an ER positive breast cancer. Very similar to the last one, um, but it's um, it's not exactly similar. So five and a half thousand mutations, big um, microhomology mediated deletions, and then a lot of deletions, not tandem duplications. And that's why the lines in the middle are pink instead of green. 
but there is copy number losses throughout, perhaps not as much as the BRCA1 mutations. Um, and then signatures wise, we've got signatures three and eight and five. So it's feeling very BRCA deficient. Um, and if you look for mutations, you'll find a MIC amplification and a BRCA2 germline mutation. Copy number one zero, so that's loss of the other allele. HR detects for very high. Nice, easy so far. This is a classic BRCA2. The previous two were classic BRCA1s, okay? So there is a distinction between them. Clinically, when we use HR detect, we don't separate between them because there's no clinical need to, but actually it is possible to distinguish BRCA1 from BRCA2 cancers. Okay, so I think this is now starting to get quite easy. I'm going to make them a little bit harder. So this is an ovarian cancer. Um, we've got 16,000 mutations. We've got one and a half thousand indels, but mainly deletions in microhomology. I've presented the rearrangement slightly differently just to challenge you because sometimes people present their plots a little differently and I don't want you to get nervous. You just need to go, okay, what's in the plot? And the plot here basically has um, deletions in red, tan amplifications in blue and uh, green and in inversions in blue, translocations in purple, which is not dissimilar to the previous plot. It's just I've added, I've spread it out a bit more. I've also added the sizes of the rearrangement. So here, there's um, deletions and tandem duplications that are less than 100 kb in length. A lot of them distributed throughout, much denser than the previous sample, right? I just want you to get used to the idea that there is variation between patients. This is a different cancer type. This is ovarian cancer. We've got signatures three and eight in spades. So I hope even though it's another tumor type, you've figured out that this is a BRCA deficient cancer. It's BRCA2. It's somatic. It's copy number one zero loss. So there is BRCA2 mutation with loss of the other allele and the HR detect score is high. I just want you to just note that it is a little different to that one in that it's just heavier in its mutagenesis. So, but it's the principle of the combination of signatures that are involved, okay? Right, so given that I've just told you that, have a look at this one. That's a lobular breast cancer. And so this looks a lot sparser, but still got four and a half thousand substitutions. It's still got a similar sort of thing with the apple back in it. Deletions of microhomology and, and quite a few um, deletions, which are one to 10 kb. That's a copy number plot, which has actually failed. So this is an example of one of the ones where the copy number plot may actually fail or not produce you a reasonable result. And the aberrant cell fraction is nothing. It's 19% but yet there's enough mutations to be able to make a call. And actually this may be quite a clinically important call. Signatures so three and eight, which is the BRCA deficiency ones. So what do you think is going on here? What's going on here is this is a BRCA2 cancer, um, but the copy number couldn't be called because it's failed. But you have a bit of a hunch that this might be BRCA2 deficient. And so you do a HR detect score and that gives you a high score. So when you're in doubt, sometimes these scores can really help you because I would have struggled to be 100% certain that this was a BRCA2 deficient cancer because the aberrant cell fraction is a bit lower, but HR detect is an algorithm. It looks for the combination of patterns and if it's there, it will make the call for you. So use the algorithms because they do help. Okay, I hope you're learning a lot here. This is another one. Looks just like the other BRCA2 deficient ones, doesn't it? Um, but it's got more mutations. It's got deletions with microhomology. It's got um, structural variation deletions under 100 kb, one to 10 kb is the most. The copper number profile, profile looks about right and it's got lots of loss of heterozygosity throughout. It's got all the rearrangements throughout and it's got signatures eight and five and three and 18. HR detect score is high. So what you're gonna do, you're gonna look for the germline and somatic BRCA2 mutations and you're not gonna find it because it's actually a PALB2 mutant. Now, um, a lot of the PALB2 mutations, um, uh, if you find a germline PALB2 mutation, don't stop because the copy number status here was 2-1. And in fact, this, there was another, uh, there was a somatic PALB2 mutation. And this was not uncommon, actually. We found that it was not that frequent that we had LOH. We often had two mutations. Um, now, some of you will say, are you sure on the, it's on the other allele? No, I can't be 100% sure because they were kind of too far apart, but but it's very likely that, that both alleles have been taken out here and given all of the other signature information, we think that this is a BRCA deficient cancer. It's just, it's turned off PALB2 instead of BRCA2. Okay, so that was just to give you a spectrum of the HR deficient tumors. 
Um, we're now going to go shift gears slightly to uh, colorectal cancer, just to show you the spectrum. So 97,000 substitutions and look at that profile. That is a really um, clear profile. It's very different to any of the ones you've seen already. It's a very distinctive pattern. Look at the insertions and deletions, 200,000, and they're all at polynucleotide repeat tracks. So this is what you call microsatellite instability. But notice how there's quite a lot of rearrangements, and I know the classical sort of description of colorectal cancer falls into chromosomal instability and microsatellite instability, but really when you're doing whole genomes, I find that a little bit hard to distinguish sometimes. So this is a colorectal cancer with quite a lot of rearrangements. Um, and um, so what do we do? We do the signatures. We find signatures one. Uh, this is so have we done the right signatures? The answer is yes. They've got the colorectal signatures. It finds an additional signature of 44. This is a mismatch repair deficiency signature. Um, so a lot of this fits with a mismatch repair deficiency. We find a germline MLH1 mutation. We find that it's copy number one zero. So all that fits. HRD tech score is nothing. MMRD tech score is very high. What are other things you could calculate? You could calculate a TMB tumor mutational bur burden, and this would fit the criteria. The criteria is often over 10 mutations per megabase. That's the FDA approved um, cutoff, although I think there's a little bit of controversy about that. But anyway, I'll just report to you the number, which is well above normal. So that is a typical mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancer with a German MLH1 mutation. OK, I think that's really classic. Here's another one. Very similar pattern here to the previous one, right? Nearly identical, huge numbers, 190,000 insertions and deletions, also some rearrangements. Look at these rings, they're almost, they're almost solid circles. Um, and then again, it's got signature 44, but it's a somatic MLH1, with copy number 10, HRD tech score, nothing, MMR tech score, nearly one, and TMB high with 21 mutations per megabase. So far, so good. This is a breast cancer. Look at that. 87,000, you've seen this pattern before. 55,000 deletions that repeats mainly, solid circles, copy number gain throughout, copy number losses plenty, not many rearrangements. Do the signatures fit? You've done the breast, common ones because this is a breast cancer, correct? Mismatch repair is not common, but remember I have mentioned that the, current, the new signature algorithms will allow you to find rare signatures and indeed it finds signature 44, which is a mismatch repair deficiency signature, finds it in spades, but there's no mismatch repair mutations found in any of the four genes. We can do HR detect zero, MMR detect very high, TMB high 29 mutations per megabase. So, you know, what do you think is going on here? So one option could be that there's been epigenetic um, from what I have a methylation to MLH1, uh, but in, in the case of this particular patient, that turned out to not be ab abnormal either. But when we did immunohistochemistry, um, we found concomitant losses of MLH1 and PMS2. So we have the protein immunohistochemistry and the signatures and the MMR detect score and the TMB score, but we couldn't find a genetic or epigenetic driver. But I think it's important to note that there are actually quite a few of these in, even in Genomics England. OK, so here's a different one. I'll tell you now it's a mismatch repair deficient tumor, but it's a different sort. So if you look at this pattern, it's not the same as the previous ones. These are the previous ones. This has got a big green um, load here, as you can see throughout here. Um, and it's still got a lot of insertions and deletions at polynucleotide repeat tracks, but unlike the others, it's got quite a lot of insertions as well. So if you look previously, the insertion, the ratio is very different. Here, the ratio is nearly one to one. So nearly solid circles. Um, and here it finds, have we done the right signatures? Yes, because this is a uterine cancer and we've done uterine signatures and it finds the rare signature 26, which is associated with PMS2 mutations. This patient had a somatic PMS2 mutation with copy number one zero, so loss of the other allele, so that was all correct. High MMR detect score and TMB is high, 13 mutations per megabase. Here is another one. This is a colorectal cancer, PMS2 mutation as well, but germline, copy number one zero. And I think we will agree this looks very similar to the previous one. Just the numbers of mutations may be slightly different, but generally the image is very, very similar, right? So these are the PMS2 sort of cancers, regardless of tumor type, whether it's colorectal cancer or endometrial cancer. But use all the other information, MMR detect and TMB high as well. Okay. I'm going to have a bit of coffee and a biscuit while you think about this one. 
and shout at the computer to tell me what's wrong with this tumor. Just realized I'm 30 minutes in and I'm starting to run out of sugar in my blood. Um, so, slightly harder, but not much harder. I hope you figured it out, but you can put it in the chat. No, you can't, the chat doesn't work. Okay, just shout at your computer. So, just two things wrong with this patient. Triple negative breast cancer. You can see P the PMS2 signature, deletions that repeat, a lot of insertions. But see all the rearrangements, 300 of them. Signature 26, that's a PMS2 one. So that's a somatic MSH2 mutation um, times two. Copy number two, one. So, hmm, not sure. <laughs> is that the cause? It looks like a mismatch of bread efficient tumor and the MMR detect score is very high. But here, look at the HR detect score is high as well. So I think the bottom line I'm trying to communicate here is that although I've covered a lot of those genomes, which is basically one major defect, when you get a whole genome, you get all the information and, pa and patients may have more than one defect. This is not unusual to find that there are several potentially clinically actionable um, uh, biological abnormalities in your sample. So in this case, this patient has got both HR deficiency and MMR deficiency. Okay, um, change gear. Um, this is a pediatric tumor. <clears throat> this is an uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So quite a lot of mutations, even for a pediatric cancer. So this is a hypermutative phenotype. So this is the Applebeck signatures. 8,000 mutations for pediatric cancers, high. Not a lot of not a lot of seen in terms of insertions and deletions or rearrangements. Copy number didn't do brilliantly. Um, but the main thing I wanted to communicate here was that this patient also had an ETV6 Rx1 gene fusion. So sometimes, you know, you get some interesting signatures, but um, don't forget about all the other bits and pieces like um, gene fusions. HR detect and MR detect scores zero. Some people would like to do curation of these gene fusions. So um, now in, this is not the ETV6 Rx1 fusion. This is another example. Um, just because I didn't want to compromise the privacy of the patient. So I've just used a different example, uh, but the principle is the same. So so, um, so if you're inclined to curate this by IGV, you could search for such an, an interchromosomal rearrangement here between chromosomes 11 and 14 um, using the IGV setting color by insert size. On the top left, the reads in orange map to chromosome 11, but their mate maps to chromosome 14 and on the right, the, the reads in brown are mapped to chromosome 14, but their map, but their mate maps on chromosome 11. And in the bottom, um, you have you can group by chromosome mate, um, and then view the mates, uh, view mate region in split screen, um, to show all of the information together in one screen. So what you would like to see is a nice cluster of reads, um, a copy number change preferably to go with what looks like a breakpoint. Um, not always visible if you've got a balanced translocation. Um, so this would be a nice thing to be able to do, I think, for gene fusion events. You shouldn't have too many of these. These are not that common. Um, and you'd like to know, in addition to being able to see these clusters of reads at the right place with a nice little change, copy number change, you'd also like to know that it generates an in-frame protein or a kind of protein that will actually do something because you can easily get gene fusions that don't are not in-frame and don't produce any proteins as well. So there's a little bit more work to do with gene fusions in the interest of time. I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing this, but but perhaps in the future when we redo some of these um, lectures, we might be able to spend a bit more time on trying to do curation of these sorts of things. OK, but I'm sort of conscious about time. I'm going to go galloping on to some other examples. Um, so this is a colorectal carcinoma. It's got 102,000 substitutions, big tall blue bar, big little and pink bar here, a lot of insertions and deletions. This blue and pink tinge, it's very pretty, and it's classic of signature 10A. This is due to a germline Paul E mutation. Does it fit as a driver? Yes, copy number 21, because it's usually as a heterozygous mutation. Um, HR detects and MR detects not um, interesting at all, but it's got a high TMB. So here's an example of something with a high TMB, but it's not due to mismatch repair deficiency. It's due to uh, signature 10 or germline Paul E mutations. This is an important one to find because these tumors are supposed to be sensitive to checkpoint inhibition. Here's an endometrial carcinoma. Again, I'd like to just you to, to spot how similar it is to the previous one. It's just the numbers have changed. 
300,000 mutations, 9,000 indels, but the pattern is very similar. Copy number failed. This is an over-segmented copy number plot. It didn't work, but there were so many mutations, you can still report that genome. So we found a somatic poll E mutation, but because the copy number failed, we couldn't make a copy number call. It doesn't really matter, I don't think. It's very clearly got signature 10 in it. So this is an endometrial cancer. Now, this is an oropharyngeal cancer. It's not your typical colorectal or endometrial cancer. But look at the signature profile, the mutation profile here. Don't you think that looks very similar to that and that? But it's far fewer mutations, right? An order of magnitude fewer mutations. Um, and this is just to communicate that you can still have the same mutational process going on, but happening at a much lower rate would, would be a TMB low, so wouldn't pass that usual TMB cutoff of 10 mutations per megabase but actually is due to somatic poll E mutation. Copy number 21, all of it fits and the signatures find it for you. OK, so it's a classic poll E mutation easily missed if you didn't look at this profile here up the right or you didn't do the signature properly. So that's a poll E mutated cancer, as I said. These are important to find because they are sensitive to checkpoint inhibitors. OK, we're still on that mismatch repair, post-replicative repair abnormalities. But here we're starting to get combinations of mismatch repair with polymerase abnormalities. So it's a double whammy. These signature patterns are very clear. So one million mutations. Look at that pattern. That is a memorable pattern. A lot of indels. These circles are nearly solid. Um, actually, I don't know how we managed to actually get some copy number results from here. TMB very high. Mismatch repair detect score really high and SBS 14. So signature 14 was reported by others, not by us, um, to be due to a combination of mismatch repair and polymerase epsilon. And that is exactly what it looks like. So that's an endometrial cancer. Here's another endometrial cancer. This one's got germline MSH6 and somatic poll E. But again, I think you'll agree the pattern is the same, even though the total numbers are different. Pattern's the same, solid circles, um, SBS 14. MMR detect score is high, TMB very, very high. So far, so good. That was an endometrial cancer. Now, glioblastoma, diff completely different tumor type. But again, I think you'll agree. You can see that this looks, uh, this has got some of the uh, features of um, the previous one. Um, solid circles again, germline MLH1, somatic poll E. Again, high TMB score, high MMR detect score. But SPS 14 is a real giveaway. This is a mixed phenotype of mismatch repair deficiency and polymerase epsilon mutations. Okay, so. Uh, some more wacky ones now. This is an ER positive breast ductal cancer. There's a very particular pattern in the subs. You can see this pattern here, 6,000 mutations, nothing else. So this is a hypermutative phenotype of this particular pattern. So mainly red dots throughout, insertions, deletions, and rearrangements, not very exciting. Copy number, not very exciting. Do the signature uh, assignment. Is it the correct signature? Yes, it is, it's breast. Is there, um, is it, uh, does it fit? So it's signature 30 that it finds and signature 30 does look like this actually. Signature 30 is due to NTHL1 mutations and the patient has, it's actually heterozygous but has lost the other allele. So in the tumor is biallelic and the HR detector and MR detect scores are zero. So signature 30 is a classic one for NTHL1. Um, this one is MVD4. Look at that pattern and look at the previous one in THL1. I hope you can see that they are different. <laughs> Even though this may look relatively similar, look at the mutation profile. Please, please look at the mutation profile because it really is such a giveaway. So that is MBD4, germline MBD4, copy number loss of the other allele. Does it fit? Yes, it does. The signature is SPS 96. So I mentioned this in webinar two before. Um, HR detect and MR detect scores are zero. Altogether, this makes one MBD4 mutant, which you're going to see in the next slide. And even though it's a completely different tumor type, it's myxofibrosarcoma. 10,000 mutations, very, very clear. The stepwise reduction of, of C2Ts at CPGs, um, very, very clean SPS 96 somatic MBD4 with copy number loss of, with loss of um, the other allele. Um, so that is MBD4. Okay, I'm sort of conscious of time, so I'm trying to gallop slightly. I do apologize. Um, but these last few are quite straightforward, I think. So, okay, so this is a lung cancer. This is a very classic of lung cancer. That's this typical blue tinge of tobacco smoke. The dots 
or there's heavy mutagenesis that is typical of the smoking um, pattern. But what I want you to spot is these dots down here. Can you see it? Remember, I said this is a log scale, right? So down here means you your your log zero. So there's only one base pair difference. So these blue dots down here are C C C A mutations next to other C A mutations, so C C A A double subs, and that's classic of tobacco smoke. You'll see it again for UV light. Um, but this is really typical of tobacco smoke. So this blue signature and these double substitutions, they do have an indel phenotype. Uh, what drivers? EGFR missense, SMARK A4 nonsense with loss of the other allele that fits these two fit. Um, HRD tech and MARTEC score, very boring, high TMB, but not because of mismatch repair or because of Paul E. When you do the signatures, you get signature four, which is your typical tobacco smoke signature. This is a classic profile for lung cancers from tobacco smoke. This is a classic profile for aristolochic acid mediated uh, cancers of the kidney and liver. You're not going to see this much in the UK. You'll see a lot of this in Asia and in the Balkans sometimes. Um, so this pattern here is due to aristolochic acid, this gray, gray tinge throughout. Um, and if you do these um, signatures, signature assignment, is it the right signatures? Yes, it's kidney, which is a clear cell renal carcinoma, and it's found this additional signature, signature 22. MMR detect, HR detect scores are low. Now, this other patient also has signature 22 erythrolochic acid, and you can see it when you use your organic interface, um, but you know, it's not as heavy as a previous patient. But it is there, and that is the beauty of the signatures exercise, that even if you've missed it, the, hopefully the algorithm hasn't. Um, and it's told us that there is signature 22 in this patient. So again, this is very um, typical of uh, uh, erythrolochic acid um, exposed um, uh, uh, cancer, even if the exposure is a little bit lower. OK, my last few minutes. This is a malignant melanoma, again, another classic an excess of mutations of C2T, always at CC or TT or TCs, because UV damages um, cytosines and thymine Cs and Ts. OK, remember I mentioned the tobacco smoke had this like double substitution going throughout, and here what you're seeing is these dots all the way around because of CC, TT double substitutions. Again, it's pathognomonic of UV damage. So the malignant melanoma is just like the skin can, it's just like lung cancers have this, instead of blue, it's a red tinge all around, but with the beautiful double subs. They do have a bit of an indel profile. If you do the uh, signatures in the analysis, you'll get signature seven. This is the right stuff because it's skin. Um, this all fits. HR detect, MMR detect, very low. TMB, high, because there's a high number of mutations, but nothing to do with mismatch repair or polymerase epsilon. So what I'm trying to communicate here is the different causes of high TMB that we need to just be aware of. OK, all good. Um, so this is a metastatic lung cancer. The patient presented with METs everywhere. Um, and when you're looking at the profile, what do you think it looks like? It doesn't look like a lung cancer to me. It looks like a malignant melanoma to me. Um, and so this look, you know, 200,000 substitutions. It's got signature seven. It's got the indel profile. It's got the double substitutions. HR detect, MR detect score low, TMB high. So this to me could well be a metastatic melan melanoma that happens to have metastatic lungs and they just haven't found the primary, I guess. Who knows? But it's sometimes useful to feed this information back to the clinicians. OK, and here is again another tumor type called an angiosarcoma, which is a tumor of the blood vessel wall lining. And um, again, um, you see a huge amount of UV damage. You can see it here. You can see the double subs in Del pattern. And if you look at the drivers, P53 missense, fair enough. CDK and two homozygous lesion, fair enough. XPC germline mutations. So clinical genetics colleagues, XPC germline mutations, these rare recessive diseases, and these patients cannot fix UV damage because XP genes are involved in nucleotide excision repair pathway and usually fix UV damage. And if in the presence of mutations, they cannot do the fixing of UV damage properly. So this UV pattern that you're seeing is normal for this patient given the XPC mutations. Um, and so if you look at the um, HRD and MRD score, it's low, TMB is high, uh, and then you do the signature extraction, you find signature 7. But can you see here signature 10 is present at a very low level, but it is there. 
And if you look here, you'll see that there is that blue and that pink bar. So when you use your organic interface, make sure you're looking at the whole thing and don't just look at the big bars in the middle, because in fact, this is not what's killing the patient, but this is what's killing the patient. It was the Paul E mutations, and that's what, um, the, remember I said Paul E mutated cancers tend to be sensitive to immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and you know, we couldn't find the driver initially, but with, with uh, manual curation, we found the Paul E mutation that had caused the signature. Because remember in webinar two, I said, nearly all the full e-signature samples, there's a driver, find it. And so we found it, but it was present in a subclone. So one of the areas I haven't been able to cover in the last three sessions is cancer evolution. I wanted to be able to explain the principle, but there isn't enough time. So um, it, when it just have been for knowledge, the most important thing for you clinically is to be able to report the drivers that are present, the drivers that are present at low variant allele fraction and are probably in a subclone. So in this case, the signature is present in a subclone and the driver is present in the subclone. So the main tumor, the angiosarcoma, has got a subclone that's gone and metastasized everywhere and is killing the patient. And actually this patient got immune checkpoint inhibition um, treatment and did extremely well for it. And so just to finish off on this idea of thinking about um, cancer evolution as well, um, you know, so here is a uh, ER positive breast cancer, good old boring ER positive breast cancer, but heavy mutagenesis. So look at this with your organic interface and spot that there is an Afobank pattern there. But spot there are a couple of little interesting bits here. There's a C2A thing here. There's a little bit of noise down here and a little bit of noise down here, rumbling noise that from the signature analysis, you can see signatures 13 and 2, which is Afobank, signatures 1 and SBS 20. Um, which is a mismatch repair deficiency signature. There's a lot of deletions, 19,000 that repeat tracts. This is very small compared to the Apobex. And so actually what's going on here is this patient has got mismatch repair deficiency um, as a result of the Apobex. So the clone, the main clone of this tumor is full of Apobex, um, but we've hit MSH2 and we've now got a subclone with mismatch repair deficiency. Now, the other last thing I wanted to point out here is all these other marks around the genome are all the other potential drivers, not necessarily the case if you've got a hypermutative phenotype. So when you're thinking about the drivers, just make sure that if you've got a hypermutative phenotype, it could happen by chance. So that's it from me. I know I really galloped through a lot of that. I'm happy to take any feedback and hopefully perhaps um, do another session where we can actually walk through some of these within a decision support tool so that we can all kind of learn together. I'm going to finish there by saying um, thank you to all the people who've done a lot of the background work on genomics and the human genome, without which we would not have been able to do a lot of our cancer genomics work. All the patients, families and clinicians that have contributed samples to all the studies that we have done. And of course, my lovely team, without whom we would not have been able to do a lot of the stuff that we have done. So I'm going to stop there because I think we're at time uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, it takes me back to some of the interpretation challenges that we had when we were first working on gel and it seems things have, have moved on quite a lot. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat. Uh, the first one was around whether the samples that you've been discussing today were FFP or fresh frozen and, and if they're FFP is that why we're seeing a lot of C to T signal? OK, so the vast majority of um, the samples were not FFPE, they were flash frozen. Um, in fact, I've got a student who's working on the FFPE stuff and will be able to report on some of the observations um, from FFPE material. Um, FFPE samples are salvageable, provided your normal is, is blood and not FFPE derived as well. I think when we have FFPE derived normal, then the failure rate is very high. But, um, but no, these are all flash frozen. A lot of the C2T is actually what you get biologically in these samples. That's really helpful. And, and yes, I, I relate to this FFP problem being that my current PhD has FFP and FFP normal. Oh no. I feel, I feel the pain. <laughs> um, and relatedly, another question that's actually quite close to my heart, again related to my own work, um, is, is around scoring of copy number change in the same way that we have these other scores for elements that you've spoken about. Are there any specific scores around copy number change or aneuploidy that we need to be thinking about? It's a great question. Oh my God. 
Um, so there are some general ones for HRD, but we, we now have so many different HRD scores um, and I have, mine has been very sort of my, sort of what I, I tend to use, but there are a couple of others that are HRD in general. It's a very good question. Some of the amplifications should come up automatically because it's so clear, like if you have a copy number of 15 or 35, that should just be really obvious. Um, do we have any other ones? I know there are copy number signatures out there as well that people are using um, and um, I don't know how applicable they are across all the different tumor types. Um, and so I, I don't know of any immediately, but it's a very good question and certainly something that we'll look into a bit more and see whether there's anything else that we can do to sort of help um, help um, some of the interpretation. I mean, we can, my, my team do use things like um, tr trying to look at the phylogenetic trees um, I don't know how useful that is clinically, though. It's very interesting academically, but I don't know how useful it is clinically. Yeah, absolutely. It's tr tricky to work out what, what, when, when it starts to just become your own fun. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, trying to answer the question. And um, there are a couple of uh, questions specifically related to in individual cases that you discussed. Um, one was around the first poll E case that you discussed and why the tumor mutational burden was so low. The first tumor, uh, Paul E. case, she said quickly scrolling through her thing. So the first one, um, the first Paul E. case was 34 mutations per megabase. So that was quite high. The second one was 108, so that was still high. The third one had a TMB score that was only six. Um, so I think that you get the high TMB scores classically for the colorectal and endometrial tumors that have mismatch repair deficiency and polymerase, abs polymerase mutations. Um, but I think for some of these other tumor types where the proliferative rate is not as high, so the colon and the endometrium are turning over all the time, right? And I think that's why we get these high, massive numbers. Um, but you don't really get that in quite a lot of other solid tumors. So I think in this oral pharyngeal cancer, it's just the proliferation rate isn't very high. And so we just didn't see the massive numbers. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a note of caution, actually, that, that things like breast cancers, even ovarian cancers sometimes, you can have Paul E or mismatch repair deficient tumors, but the TMB score isn't high. It's a good question. Thank you. And then there was another round around this, the angiosarcoma case and whether this was a cutaneous uh, a lesion, a sun, a sun exposed area. It was, it was on the medial aspect of the eyebrow. So it was, you know, um, UV exposed, um, yeah. Just looking through the chat now to see if there's any other new new questions coming in, and I think I've I've put all of those to you that have have come in so far. Good. Okay. Ah, any more? One more. Uh, around your your approach in general regarding defining a threshold for high tumor mutational burden again this is i think really interesting there's a lot of different literature depends yes. on whether you're doing whole genome or a panel yes yes okay so you know fda have approved it as a companion diagnostic on a cutoff of 10 mutations per megabase and there's a lot of controversy about whether that's the right thing to do or not um and i mean we kind of um you can, you know, at the end of the day, it's a number. Um, I mean, we have our view on what we think it should be, but, you know, I'm sort of also slightly curtailed by the fact that the FDA have made that decision, so it's a little bit hard. Um, but I think, you know, synthesize all the information together. I wouldn't just go for the number and just use that. So if your TMB score is low, but you can see the Paul E signature, it's a Paul E mutated tumor, right? Don't, don't go on the TMB score. Um, it's a bit like in a clinical case, you might sometimes find somebody who has looks like they're having a crashing heart attack, but the troponin hasn't quite got out, gone up yet because you've you taken sample too early or whatever, or your chest x-ray still looks clear. Sometimes some bits don't quite fit, but your clinical, use your clinical now, here, because this is all it is, it's just a clinical, it's a clinical report of what you're seeing. Um, and remember, this is just like doing pathology and anything else, it's never binary, it's never, there's never anything that's, you know, definitely here and definitely there. It's this is clinical medicine. There is a spectrum. And what I'm trying to get you guys to see is that you can pattern recognize. And sometimes it doesn't always fit the picture, but just always take a step back and go, does it fit? Does the clinical picture fit? And it might be this is a rare tumor. You've never seen it before, but if it fits with mismatch repair or if it fits with being a subclone of whatever, then, you know, uh, report that. Say, say that's what it is. 
Well, I think that's a fantastic take home message and a really good note to finish on. So I will thank you again for a fantastic webinar today and a fantastic webinar series. Just as a reminder, today has been recorded and the link to today's recording will be sent out to you. Um, you will see in the Q&A that links to the previous recordings are also there and they will soon be made available on the Genomics Education website. Thank you and good afternoon. Bye.